Good morning, everyone. I hope, hope this is still the morning, or, or let, let's say the new one. It's probably it's, uh, already 12 now. Yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Zhichuan. Uh, you can also call me Jason. Uh, from the School of Material Science and Engineering and also from the Solar Fuels Lab. And today my talk is about oxygen electrocatalysis on the transition metal spinning out oxides. Um, so my, uh, my own research group I named as the Electrochemical Materials, materials Lab because we focus on two things. One is the electrochemistry and another thing is the materials. Uh, in our group, we work, on, we work more on the energy problems. Let's say this is our uh, big picture background of uh, our work is on the energy problems, like say, uh, about the fossil fuels, the limited supply, and global warming, etc. And of course, we know there are arguments. Probably global warming is not by CO2 or etc. But anyway, uh, we believe if you we, if we can develop a more clean energy infrastructure, uh, for sure, it's good for the future of a uh, human being. So. Um, actually, for clean energy resources, we have many choices, like a solar fuel, uh, so solar panel, like wind, etc. The problem is, how can we deliver them to our daily life? For example, we use electricity more in the nighttime, but the solar energy is provided in the daytime. So that means we need energy conversion and storage technologies. So in, next, in this slide, I list uh, some available energy technologies. They are not new at all. For example, the fuel cells, they have more than 180 years history, right? But recent years, we can find in this community is really, really hot. Like I say, this is a very hot topic for energy technologies because the materials community, because these devices, these technology devices, the performance are determined by the materials more. So in recent years, people have better tools to understand, to investigate materials, to find out more fundamental understandings. And also they are able to engineer better materials. So that's why in recent years this is really hot. For example, the nano size, the particles, people know more, uh, catalysis on the top, and also the stability, etc. cetera. Um, today in this talk, I talk about oxygen electrocatalysis. That is two reactions. One is oxygen reduction reaction, OR. Another one is oxygen evolution reaction, OER. So these two reactions are actually involved by these three uh, devices like fuel cells, hydrogen or CO2 electrolyzers, or the sonar batteries like uh, metal ear batteries. In most of the case, to enable this oxygen e electrocatalysis, your electro materials have to be uh, noble metals. So this is a, a great challenge to the community. So I gave you two examples. So first thing example is oxygen evolution reaction in the hydrogen or CO2 electrolyzers. So you can see that in left side, in this anode side, it is very simple uh, reaction, only one reaction, which is o OER reaction. And on the right side, you have a long list of reactions. Of course, it depends on the device type. If it, it is a hydrogen electrolyzer, of course, you only have hydrogen evolution reaction. Um, but if it's that's, that is a CO2 reaction, CO2 electrolyzer, you will have all of them, right? So we know that based on the Nernst equation, the overpotential applied on the both sides actually contributed to energy loss you involved in this, uh, in this device. In another word, the overpotential actually determined your energy efficiency of these devices. So you can see that for OER, all the reactions are very, very simple, but always <coughs> high overpotential over has to be applied. So you already more than 300 millivolts. So the state art of electrodes for OER is precious metal oxides. For example, uranium oxide and ruthenium oxide. In industry, people use uranium oxide because it is more stable than ruthenium oxide. So this is a famous tough, uh, this is a tough plot to represent, to show you the activities of materials. You already, um, on the right corner sides, this is a, a better activity region. You can see that ruthenium, ruthenium oxide is better than uranium oxide. Uh, recent years, people also find the perovskite oxides like uh, BSCF, which can show highest activity, uh, can be even higher than the uranium oxides. So in the top plots, this is our dream place. You just apply a little bit over potential and able to reach high reaction kinetics. So anyway, for both types of state-art electrodes, actually we involve some precious metals, not earth abandoned elements. So we still want to look, look for cheaper materials. 
Another example is the OR in the pan fuel cells. This is a very famous diagram from the uh, from a web page of, uh, uh, sorry, I should have a cit citation here. So that demonstrates the power loss. You cannot avoid it. You cannot avoid for the fuel cells. Of course, in fuel cells, theoretically, energy conversion efficiency should be 100%, but you always get a such kind of loss, which is generated by the OR, the cathode side. The platinum is the best catalyst to catalyze the OR. However, the, the reality is you always have such kind of loss. This is because at this potential window, platinum surface is oxidized to platinum oxide. And of course, your catalyst is blocked by oxides, and the oxygen cannot reach the metallic platinum surface, and there is no OR happened. Until you apply the potential lower and lower to reduce the platinum oxide back to metallic platinum surface, and then OR began to happen. So this, is a, this energy loss is, cannot be avoided, actually. So anyway, platinum in element table is the best catalyst to catalyze the OR. Right. Of course, we can see many papers report better materials than platinum, but we don't believe that is true because the evaluation uh, method is different. Okay. So anyway, there's still a uh, 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 motivation to find uh, earth abandoned elements to replace platinum. In that case, you have to sacrifice your OR activity, but you can uh, compensate by making more stacks of fuel cell. So in today, uh, in, in this presentation, I'm going to report our group's progress f about the transition metal spin-outs. Include two stories. One is a, is a warm-up story about a pseudo capacitance of spin-out spin ferrets, and also uh, and the second story is descriptor of OR and OER on. Uh, spinel oxides. Let's look at first one, the spinel. So what is a spinel? Spinel in chemical formula is AB2 oxygen 4. So this is a, a cubic structure of spinel. You can see that oxygen forms some uh, uh, geometry uh, uh, occupation, uh, uh, some geometry uh, uh, holes. You can see that tetrahedral holes and the octahedral side, octahedral holes. We, we, we can call this a site, a geometry sites. Now, your cation A and B actually can occupy both octahedral and the tetrahedral sites. So that means some A and B in octahedral, some of them in the tetrahedrals. So that introduces one important parameter, which is lambda, we call the inversion degree. So lambda is between 0 and 1. If lambda equal to 0, that is a normal spin L. That means all the A's stay in the tetrahedral sites, and all the B's stay in the octahedral sites. If lambda equal to 1, all the A and half B will stay in the octahedral side, and another half B will stay in the tetrahedral side. That means the exchange of a position. So in most cases, lambda is between a 0 and a 1, depends on your synthesis method to spin out oxides. And sometimes your A can be the 3 plus. In principle, A should be 2 plus, but sometimes can be 3 plus. For example, gamma Fe203. So in this case, probably you can change your formula like AB2 oxygen 4.5, but if you have to pay attention, the saturation oxygen for spin out structure must be 4, cannot go to 4.5. In this situation, that means in your structure, you have vacancy of cation. Yeah. So, okay, so let, let's see how we started the pseudocapacitance spin out ferrets. We synthesized the four spin out ferrets. That is magnesium ferrets, cobalt ferrets, nickel ferrets, and iron ferrets. These small black dots, that's a nanoparticles. They are informed nanoparticle. We loaded this a ferrite nanoparticle on the carbon. You can see the bigger one is carbon. And actually shows there are all the spin out structure and the particle size from 7 to 9 nanometers. And then we load these powders on the electrode to use three electrodes. Uh, method to test their uh, capacitance. You can see that roughly, uh, this is a CV we get, roughly the bigger CV loop means higher capacitance. However, we must be very careful here because this CV loop area can be affected by mass loading of your electrical materials, right? So in this case, you have to exclude the contribution uh, influence of mass loading and also you have to exclude the contribution from the carbon because carbon also contribute a double layer capacitance. So the capacitance you are recorded here from the two parts, one from the carbon, another one from the uh, uh, oxides, the pseudo capacitance. So in this case, actually, we have to exclude carbon contribution. We measure the pure carbon con uh, capacitance, and then we know the mass ratio between carbon and oxides particle, and then we are able to exclude contribution from carbon, and then we get a pseudo capacitance, and then we normalize uh, this pseudo capacitance by 
both the mass of a particle and also by surface area particle. We would like to use the surface area as a more representative, uh, more, uh, representative parameter to describe the uh, uh, capacitance here because charge stored on the surface only. So this one actually can include the contribution from the size and also the mass loading of metal oxides. So here, based on this diagram, you can see that manganese ferrets indeed shows the highest pseudocapacitance, but all the other ferrets does not show much. So what is the reason? We did a direct, very straightforward measurement. We do the in-situ X-ray uh, uh, absorption uh, characterization. We first look at the things, look at the valence change. Uh, we can look at these two figures. We find at this potential, manganese, manganese in manganese ferrous actually indeed can be oxidized. They increase the oxidation state with the increase of potential. And all the other metal cations remain unchanged. So this is no wonder why manganese ferrous give you pseudocapacitance, but other didn't. But an interesting phenomenon here is the magnus valence change within this potential window is from 2 plus and 3 plus. But for magnus dioxide in the same potential window, that's from the 3 plus and the 4 plus. So that indicates the same cation in a different uh, outside frame. They may have a different redox ability. So anyway, let's con uh, continue. Let's go further to look at the uh, local chemistry. We look at, look at XF, and then we found that magnesium indeed has a big change on the local chemistry. Actually, we feed this data and uh, summarize in this table. So we can see that for magnesium ferrets, at a different potential, they have something different in local chemistry, especially for magnesium oxygen coordinating number. So this is inconsistent with the valence change. So again, I would like to remind you here, so the magnets actually can occupy either tetrahedral size and also octahedral size. So we are able to figure out how much uh, uh, magnets in tetrahedral, how much in octahedral, They're roughly in a one-to-one -one ratio here. We find that for, mag for both geometry occupation, magnets can increase the oxidation state, uh, lo local chemistry, that means both geometry sets actually contribute this pseudocapacitance. And then the very interesting scientific question is, which geometry contribute more? Right. So then we designed a control experiment to study this geometry influence. We changed the magnetic position in magnetic ferrets. We do the heat treatment in, in air because for magnetic ferrets, they have a very interesting principle. If you oxidize magnets from 2 plus to 3 plus, thermodynamically, magnets would like to who uh, would like to select the outhedral sites. And they will switch the position with iron and occupy the outhedral sites. So again, we scan the CV, we look at the valence change, we look at X-ray diffraction, they are still the spin outs, and they indeed oxidize relatively uh, slightly. And then we find, we look at the XF, we find magnets can be pushed into the outhedral sites with increase of a temperature heat treatment. So if you look at fig figure, figure C, you can see that more magnets pushed into the octahedral sites. And the figure A is a pseudocapacitance uh, normalized by surface area of uh, both mass and surface area, this uh, uh, magnesium ferrous heat treated at different temperatures. And then you can just simply do a correlation between A and C. You find if you have more magnets in octahedral sites, you will have a higher capacitance. So the conclusion is octahedral sites may be more influential or dominant in determining the pseudocapacitance here. But we cannot see tetrahedral contribute nothing. Tetrahedral, of course, contributes, but octahedral is more dominant. So now let's look at our story descriptor for OR and OER. So firstly, we build up a model system, build up a cubic spin outs with manganese and cobalt oxides. Why we choose manganese and cobalt? Because man both manganese and cobalt report very active for OR and OER. So we put these two metal cations into, in, into one spin out structure, and then we synthesize them. So we synthesize the six manganese cobalt oxides here. So we use temperature, uh, synthesis temperature to name these six samples, 150 degrees Celsius, 300, 400, et cetera. It is not just one sample do annealing at a different temperature. These six samples are from a different method. So some solid state chemical, some from a solid state chemical reaction, from some from a cold precipitation muscle. I just use synthesis temperature to name these samples, and then we use a rotating disk to measure the OR and the OER test. There are many things to share. If we have students, I can share the standard measurement and the evaluation uh, pro procedure because in literature we can find some overclaimed activities here. So anyway. 
after measurement, we are able uh, we we should do one more thing, which is a uh, activity, uh, which is the surface area of these oxides. We use BT to measure the surface area oxides, and then because activity can be influenced by surface area, so then we normalize the current density by surface area oxides, and then get this tough plots. We found out of six samples, both uh, they all are magnesium cobalt oxides, they all are spinels, but they have a different activity. For example, for OR, this dashed line represents the best active best the catalyst, the platinum. You can see that they still have some distance from platinum, but they indeed show different activities here. 900 degrees Celsius is synthesized the one, it ranked the best one among this magnesium cobalt oxide, and 700 degrees Celsius one is second, and third one is 150 degrees Celsius synthesized the one. They do not follow temperature uh, 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 order, actually. For the OER, it is the same. This dash line represents best act benchmark activity by uranium oxide, and also they have a difference here. So now the question is why all of them are magnesium cobalt oxide. What is the difference caused such a performance difference? So we look at the local chemistry. Firstly, we look at the uh, valence state change. We found among these six samples, cobalt valence pretty much the same, but the magnesium valence changed a lot. So we believe pretty much it is magnesium valence determined activity uh, difference. And then we look at the occupation here. We will use this data later on. So let's look at the magnesium valence uh, here. So firstly, we try to correlate the magnesium valence state with our activity here. So you can see that if I, if you do not look at this dash line here, you pretty much say these six data points in OR and OER are pretty much like scatterers, you cannot see any trend. But if I show this dash line here, it seems they follow the trend. For example, volcano plot, and also the linear relationship. So what's that? Right, let's look at OR first. For the OR, this dash line actually is from the literature, not from our group. This is from the perovskite oxides. People started the uh, uh, magnesium containing perovskite oxides. They found that there is a correlation between the OR activity and the magnesium valence. And they found such a kind of correlation, volcano plot. Seems like our spinel structure also fit this volcano plot generated by perovskite. And the question is, if spinel is the same as perovskite. So let's say in perovskite, magnesium only have one geometry occupation, which is octahedral sites. But in a spinel, magnets can occupy both tetrahedral and octahedral sites. That reminds us to revisit our data, look at the geometry occupation here. We find out among the six samples, they have different geometry occupation. Okay, and then we did one correction. We correct our data points by the occupation. We only count manganese in octahedral site as a contributor to our uh, current. And then we are able to correct our data point like this way. This is the occupation corrected the data points. We found that this data point uh, uh, fit this dash line much better. So then the question is why they have such kind of a volcano plot relationship. So this is also the known science reported by literature. For example, for manganese, Manganese in oxides, in octahedral sites, the, the, uh, for example, manganese 3 plus, they have four d electrons at d orbitals. And this uh, d orbital uh, reacted with oxygen, uh, uh, hybrid, hybridized with oxygen, uh, the p orbital, they, they, they were split to eg and t2g. And eg actually represent uh, the, the bonding strength more than the t2g actually. So because manganese is more uh, magnesium oxide usually is low spin state. That means uh, splitting energy between EG and the T2G is uh, very small. That means that you usually have electron fueling on the EG. So in this case, you can directly uh, get an EG number from the magnesium valence state. For example, this three plus, you have one EG electron. If that is uh, four plus, you have a zero e e EG electron. If that's a two plus, you will have a two EG electron. So you can do this only for magnets. You cannot do this translation for other metal cations because they have a different spin state. Okay, anyway, based on this theory, we can directly change our magnetic valence state to EG electron, EG occupation uh, in the magnets, uh, for magnets in the octahedral sites. So highest uh, EG electron means weaker bonding with oxy oxygen, and uh, uh, smaller EG electron means stronger bonding. So, you know, for catalysis, you hope bonding is not too strong, not too weak. So that's why you have such a kind of volcano plot at optimal bonding uh, uh, position, you have a bias best activity. So what about the OER side here? So this actually turns out is this a one side of volcano plot is again this related to the EG occupancy of magnets in outhedral sites for the OER. 
Okay, so same conclusion is in arterial side, the manganese EG filling is a parameter to describe the activity of this manganese cobalt oxides. And then the question is, what about other spinal oxides? We extended this to other 17 uh, transition spinal oxides. We found that roughly they follow this rule, this trend. So EG occupation of metal cations in arterial side really matters to determine the OR and the OER activities here. But of, co of course, some data points are not really fit well. So this, this means we need a further study on tetrahydrocyte and all other things because they really connect with each other with, with oxygen. Okay, so uh, uh, if you look at the tetrahydrocyte, you will not see any pattern over here if you try to correlate these the data points. Okay, so uh, um, um, we can skip this. Okay, so finally to summarize, uh, for spinal oxide, we believe the tetrahydrocyte is more dominant <coughs> in determining the electrochemical chem chemistry of these oxides. So this work is by my first student, Wei Chao, and the second student, Zhou Ye, and I acknowledge funding support from NTU and also from the Singapore uh, Research Foundation. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Do we again, there's time for a couple of questions. So, uh, very nice talk, but I'm a bit curious about this EG filling because, so, two things. One thing is that magnesium 3, I guess, typically are low spin. The other is that when you have the uneven, I mean, unequal number of electrons, then there's usually yarn teller distortion. So, have you considered how those will affect your model? Uh, sorry, affect what? Because, like, you have one electron in a like degenerate orbital, so there's usually what, what we call yarn teller distortion, which uh, makes it lower the symmetry. Okay. Yes, yes, this is, this is true. Actually, the, the demonstration here is a, uh, is a highly symmetry uh, arterial side. Actually, uh, for magnets on the surface, it is not a nice arterial. Actually, they have distortion because, uh, for example, if this is a, a active site, actually one oxygen ion actually has to be uh, replaced by OH or intermediate species like OOH or etc. So they all bounded the magnets through the oxygen, actually p orbitals, actually. So EG can represent how uh, how strong this bonding it is. But this splitting actually is actually further if your arterial side is, is distorted, it's not highly highly symmetry. Actually, this number actually well this EG energy level should be rearranged actually. Right? So this this actually represents um, so in another word Mm, actually, I, I understand your question that, that much, actually. But I, I, I think uh, the reality is during catalysis, it is not a, such a kind of a nice uh, uh, octahedral site. It, it is octahedral, but it's a distorted. Yeah. Um, and also uh, for OR and OER, actually, they, they actually, in recent study, actually, they need a different, they have different understanding. For OR, uh, Primary EG can represent its bonding strength. OER for some metal oxides, for example, in this these some oxides, they they can use this principle to explain because it represents bonding strength. But for others, for example, cobalt containing for this cobalt oxide, zinc cobalt oxide, for OER they have another understanding. It also relates to the EG electrons. They depend on if you do the uh, uh, density of a, a state of calculation. You can find the overlap the oxygen P orbital and the transition metal D orbital. You will see the how overlap it is. They call the covalency. So this is one parameter to describe. If you have a better covalency, that means a weaker bonding. So this is also affected by EG. And also another thing is the oxygen P orbital level relative to Fermi level. This is a very especially important for the oxygen evolution because if this is the oxygen, if the oxygen comes from your lattice oxygen and then your oxygen supply from electrolyte from the water, let's say, and then the, that is called the lattice oxygen mechanism. In this case, the oxygen P orbital relative to the Fermi level is very important. If it is more close to the Fermi level, that means they can be oxidized easily, and then you can lose the oxygen easily. So this is different. Actually, the mechanism between OR and OER is relatively different, but kind of you can find it's such a kind of correlation. Uh, in those two figures, uh, you take the potential according um, uh, the current density at 25 micro, 
emperor was question to me that it's very, as you see, it's very small current density. How can you promise that the current and this current density is doing oxygen evolution reaction and uh, oxygen reduction reaction because it's really small current density. And how about if you take like we see one milli ampere per square centimeter to got the potential and uh, which the little shape it's source. Yes, Thank this you. is a good question. Yeah, actually, twenty five microampere works. If you go to fifteen microampere, it also works. If you go to a hundred microampere, it also works. But if you go to one milliampere, probably now it works well, especially for the OER because at a high current density, um, you must be careful. Current density is normalized by oxide surface area, not the electrical surface area. So it's really hard to get really one milliampere per oxide surface area. If you go to that region, actually the over potential is really high. In this case, your surface actually reconstructed for OER, especially for OER, reconstructed. So some oxide actually they were transferred to uh, OOH, actually, layered structure. So it's not your spin out oxide anymore. So, so in that case, the the, the EG we're using for spin out maybe not really match on that. So, so there's another mechanism of that. Yeah. Clear. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.